<clears throat> Thank you so much, Anne. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm, it's an honor to be able to um, speak before you and present some of the things that I've learned and, and just through my own experience um, with my family and, um, and then just with all my patients. I've learned so much from from them and would love to kind of hear like uh, uh, you know this wide variety of group that we have I know we've had a lot of people come from various areas and I would love to know kind of who my audience is you know and if you've if you have Lyme or you're here as you know wanting to you know know more information to help somebody else with Lyme or if there are any practitioners so who here has Lyme oh so the majority of you and then are there any clinicians in the group and, and anybody, then the rest of the you know, people who don't have Lyme, are, are you here um, just to gain more information and understanding and knowledge of it or as an advocate for somebody else? More information? Past Lyme. Some of us got better. That's wonderful. I hope. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. We want people better for sure. So thank you so much for coming and attending. And I just want to thank um, Minnesota Lyme Association and, and all the work that you've done to establish this group and to um, be able to have a, 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 an area and a place where we can come together and to learn and to grow together and, and ultimately you know, help one another. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing. And, and also I have you know, just such a gratitude towards the organization for helping um, sponsor me to get to the ILADS um, organization out there in Boston last year in the fall I was able to attend and some fabulous speakers and learn some great information and so tonight what you know what I'd like to do is just be able to share with you some of the pearls that I learned um, at the conference and then also be able to um, you know share with you more specifically about Lyme and how Lyme affects the brain um, so forgive me with my, my technical um, you know, <laughs> difficulties that I have. I'm not really technical with these things. But um, anyway, so Borrelia, as you know, and a lot of the co-infections can affect so many different areas um, of the brain. And there's a multitude of different neurological problems in Lyme. Um, when the brain swells, um, it not only affects our prefrontal cortex and our ability to reason and and, and follow multiple steps, but it, it can affect the whole nervous system, including the autonomic nervous system, such as the heart rate and, and breathing that should be automatic can become really dysregulated. Um, we're gonna to talk tonight too about the importance of glial cells and the brain lymphatics, um, emotional healing of Lyme, and then as well, um, how, what we can do. I wanna give you guys some practical tips and, and, and tricks to learn to be able to help distinguish how, how we can optimize our brain health and, um, and be able to recover fully. 70%, I think this is a low number of people are affected um, with Lyme in regards to their thinking, their mental acuity, and their memory. And I'll tell you that probably closer to like 95 to almost 100% of my patients come in, that's one of their predominant symptoms that they have that they've noticed from the beginning was that all of a sudden they're, you know, these high executives working and functioning entrepreneurs, you know, doing, you know, just over resilience in every aspect of their their life to all of a sudden, you know what, I, they can't get out of bed and they're just not able to think clearly. And, you know, and these things just don't happen overnight. Sometimes they can, but sometimes it's this, this gradual onset where they're just decreasing ability to be able to respond to stress in and of itself. Um, the, the way that, that Lyme works is that those spirochetes, the, cork you know, the corkscrew-shaped type organism, can burrow into different organ systems of the body. And they typically love to, to culminate inside low oxygen places of the body. So it's going to be any white matter of the brain, the joints, um, and then also the lymphatic system. A lot of the lymphatics get congested, and as well, you know, sometimes the, the, the blood can become very viscous. Um, there was a um, the, the, Alan McDonald, he had autopsied a bunch of dementia patients and actually found Lyme in the brain. 
So there's usually three different ways that Lyme, you know, can affect the body and, and then thereby affect the brain. So it can, you know, actually be inside the white matter of the brain and he, is, he had found some, you know, spirochetes inside the brain. Um, Lyme can affect the vessels that feed the brain. And so it can be inside those vessels. And then the third aspect of Lyme is that it can infect the body um, and you can, you know, and so people with different, when they get a tick bite on the head versus on the toe, they have different symptoms. And that's why it's really difficult to try to pinpoint and find, you know, like, cause there's just a conglomeration of symptoms, you know, that patients have. So um, all of these things then lead to some sort of um, swelling in the brain. The, the, the lipoproteins of Borrelia are actually what cause apoptosis, which is cellular death of the epithelial cells of the brain. And that inflammation affects, you know, the person's ability to be able to process information. Um, it can affect attention and focus as well. So a list of some of the common neurological problems in Lyme include the, the concentration, the focus, the recall. So there's a lot of problems with being able to recall information. And in particularly, the ability to be able to commit new actions to their memory. So um, these are some of the most common signs of brain infection is just that lack of ability to, to recall things and particularly short-term memory. I find that that's most common, not so much the long-term, but it's the short-term memory. There's lots of depression and anxiety, um, psychosis and even suicide, unfortunately. Um, there's been many links to Alzheimer's and Lyme. And then as well, I'm gonna to talk today too just about insomnia and what we can do to help with that. And you know, with the brain being affected and, and the swelling that takes place, it can inhibit the lymphatics in the brain from draining, which also then thereby affects um, the ability for a patient to fall asleep. Children in Lyme disease, you know, they actually present so commonly with with attention deficit issues. They're unable to focus, they're unable to concentrate, they, they can't sit still, sometimes they're hyperactive. Um, sometimes children are really lethargic and you know, no child should ever you know, be lethargic. And so you know, in, in any of you who are advocating for children, you know, make sure that this child gets a good thorough workup done because oftentimes children are just, there's no reason for children to lose interest in playing or running or associating with their friends. Um, a lot of times the children will be really irritable and, and moody and have these just rage or tempers that are, that are completely irrational, like they just don't make sense. And so because there's so many um, mental health issues today in, in our society and growing up, when I was growing up, there wasn't any, I, I didn't know anybody who had anxiety. I didn't know that there was attention deficit issues. Like when I was growing up, there wasn't, there wasn't any colleagues or friends of mine in school that suffered with these issues. And so now this is so much more common. And I think that a lot of these children who have these symptoms are getting missed. And, and not being properly diagnosed. And then they go for years without being diagnosed until it develops into a more severe neurological issues. Um, oftentimes I see the, the, the prefrontal cortex like I talked about before is where um, you do a lot of organization and processing and, and, and that executive functioning. And children will often be completely disorganized when they have the, you know, that part of their brain you know, affected and, and adults alike. You know, so it's, um, it's important to recognize these different symptoms and to pay attention to them. The other thing that we often see too with children are that they just will have a lot of tummy aches. They'll just, oh, my stomach hurts, my stomach hurts. And you know, and you think, well, they just have anxiety or they don't wanna go to school or they have other issues coming up, but that bacteria can get in their stomach and sometimes that's a presenting sy um, symptom for children. Um, some of the, the physical signs that you'll see in, in the body, um, they'll be really, they'll just have a pallor about them, just a really pale, kind of sick looking skin. 
and they'll often have these allergic shiners, these dark circles under the eye. Um, that can be also, you know, an oxalate, you know, um, deficiency where they're just not able to process oxalates such as nuts or spinach and so forth, or there's some allergic reaction taking place in the body, but it can be from Lyme as well. They'll lose eye contact. They won't want to look you in the eye. They, um, they're looking down or around. Um, their reflexes become very slow. And I believe probably is because that the Borrelia gets into that joint space and it just affects affecting the neurological system, you know, the system so that, you know, they should have really brisk, you know, reflexes when you hit them with the hammer and, and they don't, they're very diminished. Um, you know, all of us know somebody, you know, that is notorious for dropping things, you know, and there'll be the one um, at the dinner table where they're spilling the milk, they're spilling their water, you know, they're dropping things, they appear to be clumsy or, or careless. A lot of those are symptoms of Lyme as well. And on, on the skin, um, you'll notice some petechiae. They're like these little red spots that um, they aren't raised at all, but they're little tiny spots that can occur on the face and on the extremities and also the torso anywhere on the body. And they're basically just broken capillaries. That comes from Lyme. Um, also some striae, you know, so the, the, there's red stretch marks that you can see um, in unusual places. You know, typically you see some stretch marks maybe along the hips or, you know, with growth spurts and things like that or on the arms. But uh, typically we'll see these stretch marks like stretched across somebody's back in more of this um, horizontal position, you know, where the back isn't growing that way. So that doesn't make sense. A lot of those striae will come um, on the shoulders. I'll see them on the knees uh, um, alike. And that is very typical of, of Bartonella, one of the co-infections of Lyme. Um, at the conference, um, there were so many amazing speakers and I really um, enjoyed, there was a pediatric outbreak session that they had and particularly it was a Dr. Elena Frid from Spain. And um, she talked about how, how Lyme isn't, isn't just a bacteria and, you know, and how it can, you know, not only Lyme, but viruses and strep and also just candida yeast overgrowth and how it insults the body. And that if it's not treated right away, how it can break through that blood brain barrier, which then leads to autoimmunity. So in our, in our immune system, in our immune system response in the body, we typically have some sort of invader that comes in. And then, you know, we have, you know, all this inflammation that takes place. And then afterwards, the innate immune system cleans things up and then you get better. Well, why is it then that, that Lyme and Lyme cases, that that whole cascade doesn't happen? And, and that's partly because of that innate immune system isn't recognizing the Lyme and therefore some patients don't clear it. Um, there's also in the process of that when it's not caught, I mean, there's rarely, rarely people I find these days do get, you know, catch Lyme right away, you know, so there's just because it's such a, you know, there's all these vague, you know, multi-systemic symptoms that just don't make sense and that, that, that a lot of providers aren't putting together in relationship to that. So it oftentimes will get missed. And then these anti-neuronal um, antibodies develop that then get through and, and cause an effect of the central nervous system, the per peripheral nervous system, and then also, um, you know, get, you know, cause these different symptoms to occur. So one of the things that Elena talked about were um, how the Lyme bacteria can affect the eyes and the muscles of the eyes. And um, she demonstrated how, you know, like if you're, you're at, you know, at a doctor's appointment and the doctor will go, okay, follow my eyes, you know, follow my finger with your eyes, but don't move your head. And, you know, so what, what she taught us was different um, ways to be able to go more in depth to look at how Lyme affects the eyes and, and thereby um, the brain. And, and why this is important is because not just Lyme, but also um, mold can really affect the vision. And if you talk to some Lyme patients and maybe you know them, you know, you yourself have issues with your eyes with a lot of strain with looking at a screen or a lot of eye strain with reading. And, you know, um, sometimes the light and how things are affecting the eyes too. And it's just, just the, the eyes feel tired. 
And so if you if you want, we can do this, you know, together, you know, um, later on. But what you can do, so convergence is when you take your finger out in front of your face and then you follow that finger closer to you, you know, you want to go right in between your eyebrows here. And so as you take your finger and you follow it in towards and you go towards the middle of your eyebrows, um, and then you should start to see double fingers. And then, and then you take it back away, and then it should come become single again. And there are some patients who they just won't converge. They, they, won't, they can go all the way here, and they don't see any kind of blurring or, or double figures. Um, you know, so that person should be referred for, for a neurovisual screening. The other part is taking your finger and following it around in a circle. And I think it's best if you have somebody next to you to try this, you know, to do this. You guys can do this on each other and just be able to see and follow your finger around in a circle like this. And the eye should flow really, really smoothly. And so when you're watching while you're doing this on, on the patient next to you or the person next to you, um, if you see these little myoclonic jerks, you know, that the eye just kind of has these little jerks like this and it's not very smooth, again, that's Lyme probably affecting um, their eyes. Um, on there, there's, so that's called pursuit. And so I'll do this on a physical exam when a patient comes in is a really good thorough eye exam, especially when they're complaining of visual issues. Um, saccades is another, another test that I like to do to look at um, how the eyes are functioning. And I'll typically take my two fingers like this and I'll have them look at my right, then look at my left, then look at my right, then look at my left. And you do that slowly about three to four times. And then I'll have them go back and forth really quick. So, you know, looking at each finger top of the finger. And some of them aren't able to go back and forth. They just, they get, it's really straining, it's very difficult, and they're just unable to perform that. Those are all signs that Lyme is affecting and the neurotoxins are affecting um, their brain and their eyes. So I will typically refer them to an ophthalmology, um, an, um, some sort of neurology specialist in ophthalmology. And there's a good one here in the Twin Cities, um, Marion Rubenfeld. Um, she's, uh, she's fantastic. She understands um, Lyme disease and uh, she does just a great job. So um, finding somebody in your local area that really understands this I think is really important. Um, so oftentimes chronic Lyme is dismissed as that not really recognizing that as a real issue and where it really is. So I want to ask you a question. Do you guys know what this is? Any guesses? Cells. Yeah, what, brain cell. yeah, what kind of brain cell? Do you know? Is it a neuron? Yep, so this is a neuron. And particularly, this is like a glial cell. So my, my kids, when I was picking out pictures on the internet of glial cells, they were like, oh, mom, that's so gross. Don't pick that one. And it was one that I thought was really beautiful. So my kids pick this one. Um, but anyway, so in neuroscience news, um, I read this research article about how you know, there's many neurons in our brain, but that for, for every neuron in the brain, there are nine glial cells that are around it and surrounding that, which I found was just really fascinating. And those glial cells actually help control our intelligence, our IQ. And so astrocytes, um, those, are, those are a special kind of um, neurological cell that are found in the brain. And those astrocytes are a type of glial cell that, that actually communicate with each other and they communicate with each other through these calcium waves. And so, like, it just amazes me so much. That's why I love medicine is, like, I'm just always learning more. And it's just fascinating to me about how our bodies are created and how unique they are. These, um, these astrocytes are in the brain are found, you know, for that more higher level thinking. You know, you think about Einstein and you think about his brain and how that worked and how many glial cells that man must have had. Um, you know, but these cells can get destroyed. And, you know, and that's, that's what happens with Lyme. And not just with Lyme, but it also happens, you know, in several other, you know, diseases, you know, and other viruses and bacteria. These toxins that, that come into the body. So Lyme has actually, there's two toxins that are related to the body and how these toxins destroy the brain cells. So there's exotoxins, and these are the toxins that are continuously release this waste material. So that's these, basically these Lyme bugs that are just pooping in our bodies and releasing all these wastes. 
And then there are endotoxins, and these endotoxins are released when a cell is destroyed or damaged. And Lyme um, is, is known to have, most Lyme patients have higher levels of ammonia. And, and this substance is also related to Alzheimer's and, <clears throat> and dementia. And the exotoxin of, of ammonia um, disrupts the brain function, and it is also very common um, that, that patients have an odor to, to them. So like um, <clears throat> I first noticed on my daughter in particular, I would kiss her head, and I could smell almost like this sulfur smell. And I was like, gosh, what is so weird? I'm like, you gotta wash your hair. So we would get in the shower and we'd wash it, you know, and, but it, it just stayed there, it didn't go away. And then, you know, sometimes an odor can come out of, you know, their, their perspiration. And, and it's just, a, it's, you know, everybody smells when they, you know, when they sweat. But it's a particular odor that's not, that's not very common. Um, the urine and the, and the feces also can be, you can smell the sulfur smell. And what happens when that ammonia continues to build up in the body, it, it causes us to become toxic. And so a lot of Lyme patients suffer from the inability to properly detox their bodies. Um, when the liver gets backed up and it's not able to, and that's our main processing organ, to be able to help dump toxins, when that gets backed up, that, that all those you know, endotoxins build up in the body and thereby cause a lot of the symptoms that um, lead to memory loss and and problems with, with just functionality. Um, the presence of endotoxins then can call on the reaction of the immune system, which release cytokines. And most of you here who have Lyme know what this feels like. You know, this release of cytokines in the body is called a Herxheimer reaction. So I'm sure most of you have experienced that if you have Lyme, where you've been treated or you've gotten some sort of herbal antimicrobial or you've had you know, some sort of antibiotic and, and this caused the cytokine storm to be released and exacerbate symptoms in your body and in your brain. And so the key to really helping Lyme in those cases is to be reducing inflammation. And you know, there's so many multiple ways to reduce inflammation. And I'd like to know from you guys what you guys do for your diet. What do you do and what you, what you eat? Because you're, you're, the adaptations in the diet are so important with Lyme. So I wanna know what do you do? How do you, how do you eat? What are some foods you wanna stay away from and what are some foods that you wanna eat more of? I'm completely off of grains and carbohydrates. And how, how has that helped you? Mm -hmm. And it makes um, like my sleeping better, my mood's not so crazy, um, and I can take more medicine, so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, so grain-free, that's, that's a great way to approach Lyme for sure. Yeah, so, so he's grain free, so he doesn't consume any grains of any kind. And that's really helped to reduce the inflammation in his brain. Um, it has affected um, his gut and then also mood. So becoming more stable in his, um, in his moods and not having such drastic swings. And that has a lot to do with the way that your body will process grains and um, how those grains turn to sugar in the body and then sugar feeds those microbes and it's this vicious cycle of inflammation taking place. What, what, how do you help your body with diet? Um, I'm avoiding sugar and dairy products and grain liquids generally. Mm -hmm. So avoiding sugar, avoiding grains and dairy. And dairy is a major component of inflammation in the body. We used to have in, you know, back, you know, I don't know how long ago, but we used to have all A2 um, protein cows. They were good Jersey cows. And um, the proteins um, produced, you know, this good milk that we could drink and not cause inflammation and problems. Well, as, as we in America have discovered crossbreeding and, and increasing production of milk and, and having more production is going to lead to more money for the farmers and so forth, they found that A1 proteins actually produce a lot more um, production of milk. So predominantly here in the States, we have a lot of A1 cows and that um, actually the, that there's a particular um, chemical in that type of A1 protein 
um, I think it's called the, BM, the BCM7, um, that can cause actually and punch holes in the gut lining. And that's what causes a lot of the inflammation and people who become, they think they're lactose intolerant, but they're actually, you know, casein intolerant. And it's the A1 casein um, that causes problems. A2 casein is, comes from goats and sheep. Those are predominantly A2 casein. So some people who can not tolerate the A1 can tolerate A2. But for the most part in general, what I recommend is staying away from all dairy at first so that you can really see how your body responds. And it actually takes about two Two weeks to actually de detox the dairy out of the body. So there's, and so you have the first two weeks, your body's just trying to get rid of all the dairy and the inflammation that it's caused. And then you have the remaining two weeks, you know, and because I tell patients to do at least 30 days without dairy and gluten and, you know, and sugars, and then be able to see how your body responds. Because some people say, well, I tried going dairy free and that didn't really do anything. And they may try it for a week or maybe two weeks even, but that still has that in their system. How else? Any other ways that people are using their diet to be able to help reduce inflammation? that we haven't mentioned. Yeah, so those are the primarily what, what I do recommend as well. And, and ultimately, I mean, it's very difficult for patients when they come in and I'm telling them, you know, don't do this and don't do that, you know, kind of thing. And they walk away and they're overwhelmed and they don't, you know, and, and especially in particular going completely grain free, they're like, they're blown, their minds get blown and they just don't know how to respond to that. So it's a gradual process, you know, and I typically will pick um, dairy and sugars to be the primary ones. If you can pick any of them, try those two first um, because I think you get the greatest gain on that. Nightshades are something also that, that will cause inflammation and particularly in the joints. And there's, a, there's an AIP protocol, um, paleo protocol, it's autoimmune paleo diet, and you can look into that. And that's you know, even more restrictive um, than you know, just a regular paleo diet because it doesn't, it doesn't include you know, um, legumes or any kind of um, nightshades and so forth. And that oftentimes I find patients get really good relief. Were you gonna ask a question? It is. Rice is a grain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wild rice. Wild rice is actually a seed. And so some people do okay with tolerating that, um, some wild rice. And so, you know, and, and I just wanted to, to state, you know, it's, I encourage my patients, you know, I'll recommend, you know, trying to follow, you know, a particular diet, but that diet isn't gonna be exactly what you need. So coming and becoming in tune with how your body's responding to your foods, like doing this elimination of taking some of these foods out, but then paying attention to like how your body's responding. And, you know, so I've had, I had a patient who did AIP paleo, and they came back and they're like, gosh, I had so much relief. I felt so much better, but I'm still getting a lot of gassing. I'm still getting a lot of bloating. And through a series of questions, and she also started, you know, she was having a lot of itching as well. So then for her, I suggested, well, probably adding in the low histamine foods along with, you know, the AIP would give a big, bigger gain. And that was, that was what the, her key issue was. So everybody is gonna respond differently to, what, to what's recommended and what's given, but really pay attention and be in tune with your body to see what's gonna be best for you. And you may not be able to do very well being completely grain free. Maybe that really affects your, your sleep and you're not able to sleep at night. And some people do better with having a little bit of grains before they go to bed because they make them sleepy. And so paying attention to those little signs and subtle keys will be helpful. Another place that of reducing inflammation in the body is obviously reducing toxins from any kind of exposures of plastics that have all these hormone disruptors in there. So, you know, people are getting all these BPA products, BPA free products now, because that has come into the news as far as being damaging to um, your hormone system and your endocrine glands. Well, what are they making now? These BPA-free products, they put BP, BPAS in there. So it's another additional chemical that who knows is that stronger or more toxic than the BPA-free. You know, so for primarily just avoidance of all plastics, no matter what kind they are. And it's not so much just when that plastic gets heated up, you know, um, you know in the sun, if you left a plastic water bottle in your car, but it's heating anything that comes like plastic frozen meals and those plastic 
trays or heating those in the microwave, that would be horrible. Um, all of those leached chemicals into the food. And on top of that too, even, even receipts that you get at the grocery store, those are laden with BPA. And so if you have to have the receipt, then ask them to put it in your grocery bag and wash your hands immediately after you know, touching your receipts. There's so many ways, it is so sad that all these toxins are coming in from all, so many different angles, but there are ways to become knowledgeable to understand where are these toxins coming from and how do we get them out of our bodies. So one of the primary, pri primary ways that we can release some of these toxins out of the body is making sure that our diet is, is good, that we're eating a lot of cruciferous vegetables that are gonna help to detox the body um, and detox the liver in particularly. Um, but some patients don't do well with, with raw fruits or raw vegetables because it's really hard for their digestive system to break it down. So therefore, I would recommend starting with just cooked vegetables, you know, to start with until your, your gut is able to be healed and sealed up. Um, lymphatic drainage is also something that's very important. Um, I'll get more into the lymph later on, but that's something that I, um, that I really would like to teach you about. As well as some of the other neurological issues that take place are, um, is majorly sleep deprivation. And, and the more sleep deprivation that you have, the more compromised your immune system becomes. And, you know, sometimes it's not enough, you know, for, for patients just to, you know, say, okay, we need to develop a really good sleep hygiene. So no screens, you know, three hours before you go to bed, take a hot bath, read a book, um, you know, some of the basic supplements, as you know of, of like melatonin or um, valerian root or 5-HTP and things like that. Sometimes those things just really aren't enough. And when I have a patient that comes back, oh, I tried doing this sleep hygiene stuff and that just didn't do anything for me. Um, I'll look, take a deeper look and look at their hormones and try to see, is there, are their progesterone levels really low? Oftentimes that will cause really early morning awakenings for a lot of women. And, um, and then look at the thyroid. The thyroid can be hyperactive or it can be hypoactive with Lyme. So trying to get the thyroid balanced will really be helpful in getting patients to sleep better. And then our adrenals. Our adrenal glands are these little kidney beans that sit on top of the kidneys that excrete cortisol. And so sometimes with um, chronic illness, I find that cortisol levels are really high in the evening for these patients. And so they have a really difficult time trying to get to sleep. And that's because they're in that, that fight, flight, or freeze mode and they're almost, they're wired but tired. And so looking at how to, we can support the adrenals, um, we'll talk about more later on. Um, with blood sugar balance, so insulin levels in the body can be disrupted. And, you know, so if you're having these, these awakenings at night too or inability to fall asleep, you know, so I see this more commonly with patients awakening in the middle of the night is where their blood sugars may be off. And, and so that when their glucose levels get low, and so the body's doing all this repair work right at night. So it's, it's repairing, it's, it's detoxing. And so sometimes it'll run out of glucose. And so then, you know, for patients whose blood sugars aren't really well balanced, perhaps eating a little bit of protein um, or with some fat before they go to bed, some good healthy fat. So if you had, let's say you had some um, salmon or some chicken, you know, for dinner, maybe save a little piece of that so you can have that with a little bit of ghee, um, which is a clarified butter on top of that before you go to bed at night. And that will help to balance your blood sugars to keep them more even throughout the evening. Um, EMF exposure is is, is huge and there are so much more research going on with, with EMFs and electric magnetic radiation that comes from screens, that comes from Wi-Fi, that comes from our cell phones and, and how this dysregulates um, melatonin in our bodies. Melatonin is that hormone that helps us to get to sleep and, and so with having that blue light that diminishes the melatonin levels in our bodies. So that's why I suggest, you know, a part of the sleep hygiene is to make sure that you're not on screens prior to bedtime. Make sure your cell phone is out of your bedroom. So many of us are using our, our cell phones as alarms to wake us up. And, and that is the, the cell phone and the radiation that emits actually inhibits you from getting into that alpha wave of the brain um, to be able to get you into REM sleep, so that, that rapid eye movement sleep, that deep sleep for healing.
So I really recommend strongly not having any kind of Wi-Fi um, in the house whatsoever. So I have patients um, purchase at Home Depot one of those um, strips that you can plug different things in and it has a timer. So often people will use that for lamps in the house. And you can plug your Wi-Fi box into that. And so then it'll, the Wi-Fi will actually turn on at whatever, five o'clock in the morning, and then it'll turn off again at 11 o'clock at night. So the Wi-Fi is off throughout the whole house. Um, the, other, the other thing that I found that's really helpful, especially for children, children are super sensitive to electric magnetic radiation. Their skulls are thinner, um, their bodies are very the neurologically immature. The radiation exposure is up, you know, uptakes in their body so much greater than an adult body, but both are affected equally. Sometimes you even have to, um, if you're still having problems after removing all those things and trying all those things, um, I will um, ask patients to get a green wave filter that they can plug inside um, the sockets, um, the, the electric sockets in their, in their bedrooms, and that will help um, stem out any kind of um, dirty electricity that's coming in the room. So if people who are really electro sensitive, um, there's other things that you can do to help protect yourself so you can really have a really clean sleeping place um, that you can be able to rest and, and restore. Um, the other way that I see reducing inflammation in the body too is um, for people who are awakening in the middle of the night, um, because your body's in this process of, of working through detoxing and, and getting rid of toxins and processing all of this, I'll typically, um, if, if a patient is having those awakenings, I will have them try some glycine. Glycine um, comes in a powder um, form, and glycine is one of those, um, the three components that make up glutathione. And glutathione is one of the, the mother antioxidant hormones in the body that help our bodies to detoxify. And there's three elements that make up glutathione. It's glycine, um, glutamic acid, and cysteine. And so a lot of times practitioners will use N-acetylcysteine, which is an amino acid, um, to help boost glutathione levels in the body which is great. Um, and then I also add in, like, so when I have patients that are awakening, I'll have them do five grams of glycine powder before they go to bed at night. And they'll come back and tell me, oh my goodness, I have never slept through the night before. And they slept so hard that the, you know, the baby didn't even wake them up or, you know, the dogs didn't, you know, and the cats in their rooms and so forth didn't wake them up. So if that's something that you haven't tried, that may be an option. And as I, well, I recommend starting with just half of whatever's recommended. So I recommend five grams but work up to that. Start with just two, you know, 2.5 um, and see how, that, see how that works for you. Um, you can mix it in with some water and, and drink it. It actually tastes a little bit sweet. Yeah, do you have a question? Glycine. Glycine is G-L-Y-C-I-N-E. Mm-hmm. Yep. Where would you buy that? Where would you want it? Where would you get it? Oh, where would you buy it? Um, Amazon typically will have that. Vital Nutrients is a really reputable company that I typically like um, offering to patients just because we do a lot of research um, at the clinic I work at looking at really good quality products. There's a lot of things that you can buy over the counter, but they may not necessarily be tested you know, for other um, excipients that can be in there that can cause disruptions. Yes? What company was that again? The company was called Vital Nutrients. Mm-hmm. Oh, as on the other slide, they had on there too, so glutamate. Glutamate can be really excitatory in the brain. And um, so sometimes for patients, decreasing inflammation means that they may need to stay away from high glutamate foods. And some of the high glutamate foods um, can be um, some, you know, uh, tomatoes, um, it can be some coffee or chocolate, um, things like that. So removing and nitrates, so a lot of smoked meats and cured meats and so forth. Um, I often find that, that patients with Lyme don't do very well with cured meats. Um, and so when you're looking for meats, look for uncured, um, no nitrates added you know, to them. And that helps to reduce inflammation as well. Um, the glymphatic system and um, the cisterna chile. So the glymphatics are actually the, what helps to drain your brain. So your brain actually has a, its like own lymphatic drainage system. And, 
and 70% of the brain lymphatics drain through the sinuses. And so I see so many patients that, that have sinus congestion and they can't even breathe out of their nose very well. And that I think comes from a combination of just those lymphatics you know, being backed up, but also it can come from mold or other toxin exposures. And so getting the sinuses cleared out before you go to bed at night, um, using a neti pot is a wonderful thing. Um, I will oftentimes encourage patients to get over the counter X, X clear. It's a type of um, nasal spray that contains xylitol and xylitol can help kill off some of the pathogens in the nose. And it's just the letter X and then clear. And, and that you can uh, open up the top off of the bottle of the X Clear, and you can add in some grapefruit seed extract, which will be a biofilm buster. And all of us have, you know, in our bodies this, this kind of mucousy, slimy layer that can line the mucosal lining of any part of our mucosal linings, of our sinuses all the way down to our anus. And so this slimy layer is called a biofilm, and that biofilm blankets um, bacteria and viruses. And so grapefruit seed extract will help to break up those biofilms in the sinuses and thereby help in, you know, eliminate some of these. And then the, the xylitol will help to kill off some of these pathogens and get them out of our system. So doing just one squirt in each nostril once a day to start with, you may have some die off, you know, you may have some, you know, some headaches or excessive drainage out of the nose with getting some of these bugs out of the sinuses. And so it's important um, to start really low and gradually work up to eventually being able to do two sprays in each nostril twice a day. The other thing that I really like for the sinuses is our Argentin 23. Argentin 23 is a, is a nanoparticle size um, silver. And so you may be familiar with colloidal silver. Um, Argentin 23 is a hydrosol silver, so it's, it's got the nanoparticle size, so it's very fine and doesn't cause an, an, an um, accumulation in the body, which would lead you to be a blue man syndrome is what happens with people consuming too much of colloidal silver because that's a larger, a larger molecule. So getting the sinuses to drain properly is important and becoming more of a nasal breather versus a, um, a mouth breather. And if you notice that you're a mouth breather, there's um, a couple tricks that you can do for that too. You can take, get some, um, you know, Walgreens or any kind of drugstore has uh, a micropore tape um, and 3M makes it and you can tape your mouth shut. And you do this during the day and try to retrain your brain how to breathe through your sinuses and breathe through your nose. And so um, you would tape your mouth for about a half hour, you know, twice a day, work up to one hour twice a day, and then be able to tape your mouth shut at night and throughout the night. And this works very well to get patients into a deeper sleep and helps their brain to drain and, and detoxify their body properly. Um, another, another thing that's going to help the brain to, the, the glial um, lymphatic system to drain at night is elevating the head of your bed about 10 centimeters. When your, brain, when your head is tilted forward just about 10, um, 10 centimeters, it's going to allow that lymphatic system to drain better. And so um, position is, is, is key in getting our lymphatics to drain. The other thing I recommend before going to bed too, if you're not taking a bunch of things, you know, if you're not having to take magnesium and other supplements to help you get to sleep, taking a binder before you go to bed is really powerful. So a binder is something such as activated charcoal. So if you have a toxic overload, if you've ingested something that's toxic, you go to the ER, they're gonna give you activated charcoal. And what that charcoal does is acts like a mop and it, or like a sponge and it'll, sponge up all of those toxins that you accumulated, get them into the intestinal tract so it can be, be excreted. So there, um, I don't recommend charcoal on a regular basis because it can bind to too many minerals and then also can lead to constipation. And oftentimes Lyme patients either have constipation or they have loose stools. And so other binders are things like zeolite, um, living clay, modified apple citrus pectin or pectisol C, um, you know, so there's a variety of different binders that are out there. 
Even fulvic and humic acid are, are elements of the ground that are natural um, binders that can help bind onto toxins. So taking some sort of binder prior to bedtime will help your body to process because it's doing all this regenerative processes during the, during the nighttime. So having a tox or something that's gonna absorb those toxins while you're sleeping is really helpful so then you get up in the morning hopefully to be able to eliminate those toxins. Yes? I'm not gonna remember the, these binders that you said. Where could I find that if I just Google binder on the internet? Yep. Oftentimes, yeah. So, you know, uh, if you Google bind, binder products um, for, for toxins, a lot of these will come up on there. So, is, is like a pill you take or what is it? some of them are powders, like zeolite is a powder, um, and um, also Pectisol C, which is a modified apple citrus pectin, that's also a powder. And I like doing powders in my practice just because I have some patients who are super sensitive, and a lot of them with um, mast cell activation syndrome that can react to things so quickly so they have to open up the capsules and so if it's just in a powder you can take minute amounts and gradually work up to the full dose of it. Mm -hmm. Some of them are capsules. Um, zeolite comes in a capsule as well um, as you know the activated charcoals in a capsule it can come loose as well so there are a variety of different kinds of binders. So posture, we talked a little bit about how the, the brain in the situation of, of the, the head while you're sleeping, but we also have the, uh, the cisterna chile, which is um, it's a grouping of, of three um, different kind of vessels um, that are located just above L3, so in your lower lumbar spine here, it's located right above there. And I, oftentimes I will see you know, that this can get um, blocked with just a long car ride, with sitting too long. Often, most of us are sitting too long at our desk and in our jobs. Um, it can be from an airplane ride. I mean, who, who has experience going, you know, just to the East Coast and you go to the East Coast, you get there and you don't poop for several days. You know, it's because that, that cisterna chile um, lymphatic drainage system has been blocked. And so some of the things that you can do to help with that are even if you have digestive issues and you've had issues with um, eliminating and so forth or getting a lot of bloating after meals, um, stirring up and getting that lymphatic system working is really helpful. You can take your hand and you place it right underneath your rib cage and then place your other hand over it. And then you can just gently pull, you know, push up five times. So you're going pushing in and then up and then you're going down three times. So you're pushing in and then down, and that will help to get that lymphatic system moving. The other things that I would recommend, um, you know, like a lot of people have exercise balls at their house, these round, big, you know, balls that you can do exercises on. Um, you know, getting that lymphatic system moving, you can just sit on an exercise ball or even at work, you can sit on an exercise ball, which really helps to stabilize and work your core muscles and help with you know, your back posture, but that stimulation of jump, you know, a little bit of bouncing up and down will get the lymphatics moving. Lyme loves to hang out in the, in the lymph, you know, and cause a lot of congestion in there. So starting with just five minutes of some sort of lymphatic drainage, and then being able to, um, you know, take a binder to be able to help. Binders are meant to be taken um, three to four times a day, and it's really difficult to get that in. You're gonna have to take them an hour before food and supplements, or two hours after. And so it's really difficult to get in that many binders. Yes? Uh, cholestyramine? Yeah, so cholestyramine is another um, binder that's really helpful, um, and particularly for mold patients. Um, there are some recent studies that show that it can cause some, like any kind of pharmaceuticals, can cause some mitochondrial dysfunction as well. So um, for patients who you know, are, just can't afford to buy the binders over the counter, that it's a great alternative to as far as a prescription to be able to help to get things bound up and that it, insurance will often cover that. Great question. Um, another way for accessing lymphatic drainage is exercise. And you know, even though a lot of my patients are bed bound and they're really limited as far as what they can do, um, getting, you know, just tightening up all the muscles and doing a progressive muscle, you know, tightening and then relaxation, you know, from the toes and tightening all the way up throughout the whole body and your fingers and whatnot, and then releasing, that can help. Um, doing lymphatic massage or some sort of um, 
you know, any kind of massage, you know, deep tissue massage is gonna be able to help with the lymphatic drainage system as well. Um, so pasture is super important. Don't sit for more than, more than an hour. Try to get up and walk around. You know, get up and move your body as often as possible to help keep your lymphatic system healthy and flowing. Oftentimes, um, you know, I'll have patients come and they'll, they'll be doing everything that I had suggested and they'll, um, you know, come back and they'll be like, I just don't, still, I'm just not, I'm just not 100%. I'm st I still got this fog in my brain. I still am reacting to some foods. You know, I'm still having these issues. And, you know, so when they've done everything that we're, we're talking about um, and are still remaining stuck, the limbic system in the brain oftentimes can become dysfunctional. So the limbic system is, is, is in many structures in the midbrain, and it's re responsible for perceiving threat. So it's either going to tell you that something is really alarming and going on, or it's going to tell you, no, it's not such a big deal. So that limbic system is, is, is situated there for us to help us run from that saber-toothed tiger, you know? So it's there for us to, to get away from harmful situations. And when that part of the brain has been, has been triggered by infections, it, it comes into, you come into this state of being that you're just constantly in that fight, flight, or freeze mode. And that your, con your cortisol levels are constantly high or they can just totally start to flatline after a while. And so that limbic system sometimes needs to be retrained. So you've cleared out, you know, the infections, you've done, you know, rounds of, of antimicrobials, whether herbs or antibiotics. Um, in our clinic, we also utilize low-dose immunotherapy and found that to be really, really helpful for patients um, to help re-educate their immune system and how their immune system is supposed to respond to these bugs and these infections. Um, the the damage that can occur to our limbic system, not as just from Lyme and Lyme neurotoxins, but it comes from chemical exposures. How many of you walk down the aisle of, you know, getting laundry soap in Cub Foods or wherever, and just that smell just permeates and you feel sick and you get a headache from it? Um, you know, mold, other viruses, um, excessive EMF exposures, um, and also emotional trauma can cause dysfunction in our limbic system of our brain. Annie Hopper um, is, is, is fabulous. She created, she had suffered from multiple chemical sensitivity and was basically, you know, she could not even live in her home anymore. And she was it, only, she was able to live in this boat, you know, where it was away from EMFs, it was away from chemicals, um, and it was very difficult for her. And through her search to try to figure out how she could be helped because she wasn't finding help anywhere, um, she understood more about the brain and how the brain functioned in that limpa the, the limbic part of the brain that becomes dysfunctional from that constant threat of your body's going to flare, your body's going to react, you're constantly in inflammation from bacteria. And, you know, it's not just having Lyme, it's, it's the toxic chemicals that are in our environment. And then it's emotional traumas from people not understanding. You know, you look normal, well, you look great. You know, what's wrong with you? You know, why can't you get out of bed? You know, I see so many patients that are so misunderstood and, and not being well heard from their doctors. And so, you know, this, that's a type of emotional trauma, just that feeling of alone and not feeling well understood even by your own family members, um, that chronic, dysregulation of that limbic system needs to be retrained. And Annie Hopper has a book called Wired for Healing, and she explains the system and explains what is available of how to can retrain the brain in those different processes um, that she could, you know, take you through. So I recommend reading her book. And, you know, she does have a class that she offers. It's called, it's called a, a brain boot camp, and it's dynamic neural retraining system. 
And, um, and so she utilizes different exercises that you can do and exposures to you know, different stimuli that cause reactions in the body. And she's got multiple YouTube, there's multiple YouTube videos online of testimony after testimony of how patients that, that this was the last thing they tried and it was the thing that got them 100% recovered. Um, you know, Robert Navio uh, is a researcher that at the University of San Diego, and he, he had talked about the cell danger response. And so like there's this chronic inflammation that takes place in the body. And, and I really believe that that is contrib that the limbic system dysfunction is what contributes to that cell danger response. So when we can clear up, clean up the brain and get the brain functioning again, that's when patients start to feel better. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, that, that feeling stuck and feeling that chronic anxiety, like a lot of patients, they'll, they'll feel better after being treated for Lyme. Their, their pain will get better, um, but they still have anxiety. They still have OCD symptoms. They still have, you know, some of this depression and so forth. Retraining the limbic system will help with those things um, to be able to clear those out from being like a negative primitive brain to more of a positive primitive brain. We talked a little bit about this sympathetic overdrive, which is where that you're running from that saber-toothed tiger, you're, you, something's chasing you, it's these infections that are causing this chronic cortisol output um, that puts us into that overdrive. And what we want to do is we want to try to balance it with getting into that parasympathetic phase of the nervous system. Does anybody know what the parasympathetic system is and how that operates or what you can do to get yourself into that parasympathetic state? What's that? Meditation. Yeah, meditation is wonderful for getting into that parasympathetic state. What else? Anything else that? Sleeping, right? Yep, sleeping, yep. Anything else? Yep, deep breathing. The diaphragm is wonderful um, in doing those singer's breaths is what some people call it, is using the diaphragm in combination with meditation is is very powerful combination. What was the other thing you mentioned? Is exercise helpful? You know, exercise is almost a type of stress in the body, but it's also helpful to clear out cortisol. So patients who have really high cortisol, doing some high intensity interval training can help clear out some of that cortisol. So by way of that, it can help. Uh, diaphragmatic breathing was mentioned. Diaphragmatic breath work alone can lower cortisols by 20, cortisol by 23%. You know, I'm sorry, there's no other adaptogenic herb or supplement that you can take that can reduce the cortisol levels that greatly, and it's something that's free and accessible. So if you take your hand on your heart and put your hand on your belly, it's easier to show you and demonstrate it. So if I'm gonna take a deep breath in, my belly is gonna go out, so I'll take a deep breath in, and then I push it out, and the belly should go back to your spine. So again, you're taking deep breath in, and then pushing it out. So nothing on the chest should move. It's all coming from the diaphragm. And when you activate and use that diaphragm, that diaphragm triggers the vagus nerve. And then that vagus nerve causes an autonomic relaxation response <laughs> to take over the body. So if you do that, you know, if you just do five five diaphragmatic breaths before you eat your meal or just even a couple diaphragmatic breaths and you get your body into this state of rest and healing and digestion, you're gonna notice a shift and a change. You're gonna digest your food better. You're not gonna get so gassy and bloaty. Your bowel movements will be improved. You know, there's multiple different, the anti-aging aspects come into play with diaphragmatic breath work and meditation. There are multiple studies about that. Exactly. Yeah. So doing that, um, I recommend doing that like in the morning before you get out of bed is taking five diaphragmatic breaths and just think about, you know, think about in your body, what do you need? You know, so take a deep breath in, take a big sip of some joy and, and let out forgiveness. Take a big sip of peace in your body 
and let out strength and utilize the breath before you get out of bed to be able to um, you know, disconnect with what your body needs for today and then being able to um, have that, that mantra throughout the day be carried through and it just relaxes your body instead of waking up and feeling frazzled and oh my goodness, I got so much to do and how am I gonna do it and let your mind wander like that. Doing that before meals is really helpful and then again, doing some diaphragmatic breath work before you go to bed, or if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, put your hand on your heart and your hand on your belly and get that belly moving up and down. And that will help to bring you back into that parasympathetic state is for rest, digestion, and healing. Another part of brain retraining that I really like um, is you know, every, all of us know, and even especially if you yourself have experienced um, depression, um, what, does, what does the posture of somebody who is depressed look like? What does their posture look like if somebody depressed? Yeah, like this, they're down, their shoulders are slumped, you know, and they're, they're just down. So part of retraining the brain is, is reposturing yourself. So getting yourself into a position of power warrior modes. So what are that looks like? Maybe that looks like this, you know, for you. My daughter, she's notorious for going, you know, like this. And, you know, she just does these at random times. And I love that about her because, you know, she's empowering herself. She's putting herself in a position of power. You too should do this and try to see how your mood and how, how your depression will lift just by posturing yourself in a particular way. Have you ever seen a depressed person walk around like this, you know, and, you know, and have these, you know, type of demeanor? No. So shifting your posture will help retrain your brain in that position of power and, and being a warrior and telling, telling yourself how powerful you are, telling yourself how, how strong you are and that your body is healing. All of these elements are so important. Another thing I like to encourage patients to do um, in all your basic activities that you're doing, when you're, whether you're cooking in the kitchen, whether you're brushing your teeth, um, use your non-dominant hand. So I'm right-handed, so I'll use my left hand to brush my teeth. It takes me a lot longer and I do a better job and I'm not pushing as hard on my gums and, and so forth. So there's a lot of benefits to using your left hand and retraining your brain to be able to do new things. You wanna rewire those neuronal pathways to be able to get your brain to respond, to regenerate. You know, many, many years ago, they thought, you know, once you have a brain injury, you're just, you're brain dead in that part of your brain forever. And now we know with neuroplasticity that our brains are like plastic. They can regenerate, they can move, they can restore. And so utilizing your brain in such ways to be able to help do new, do regular activities with your non-dominant hand will work. The other thing with brushing your teeth is, is standing on one leg using your left hand and utilizing the core and utilizing balance. It's a major brain um, activity to be able to do and then switching legs in that position. So cooking on the stove, if you're used to whisking and stirring things with your right hand, use your left hand and vice versa. Another way that um, is really helpful to cause, so like all of us have cells in our body that are, are defective and that are gonna slough off. Um, one of the things that you can do in regards to your diet is intermittent fasting or periodic food restriction. And so I recommend this with patients who are struggling with blood sugar control, um, with patients who are just so fatigued and they just really are just, you know, not able to have enough energy. And what happens with when you, like, let's say you stop eating at seven o'clock at night and then you don't eat anything until seven o'clock the next morning. Most of us do that, so that's 12 hours. Auto, um, autography happens, which is cellular death and regeneration, when you've gone beyond 12 to 17 hours of no food. So if you're doing some food restriction, some of those cells in the body that maybe aren't operating very well will die off and grow new cells. So you're getting some new cellular growth that takes place and happens. And you know, so I recommend starting just doing 12 hours without anything to eat and then gradually add on, tack on two hours the next time and see how, how long you can go. And during that time period, it's really important to make sure you're well hydrated. And so if, if 
doing just water isn't enough, then maybe doing some coconut water with that has some natural electrolytes in there or um, utilizing some soup broths, you know, some bone broths or meat broths are really good too that you can do during that fasting period to get you to that lunch hour to then where you can eat. Now when you go to eat, the purpose isn't just a gorge and binge for that period of window from 12 to seven, it's just to, meet, you know, to continue to restrict how many calories you're eating and eating really nutrient dense foods so then your body will able to be better able to um, Resilient, you know, cause resiliency to take place and cause that cellular healing at a deeper level. Laughter. Laughter is so important. You know, when we're faced with chronic illness and it's day after day that you're living with this, you know, um, depression and with de fatigue and inability to, you know, effectively communicate, word finding, all of these things, it just becomes overloaded for our bodies. And then you become very serious. And there is such a thing called laughter yoga. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it's a type of yoga and they have free classes all around the Twin Cities that you can go to and attend and you know it's it's you know where you are in this group and you know the leader in the group will will have you do certain poses like act like you know your favorite superhero and zoom around you know this building and but you got to be laughing the whole time that you're doing it and you know you feel really ridiculous when you're in the class when you started because I had to take this I was like I'm gonna try this and see what this is like and you just have this spontaneous laughter that starts well somebody else starts laughing and you're like, oh my goodness, they look so ridiculous. And then you start laughing at them, but then you start laughing yourself. And so watching, you know, I mean, reading some sort of, you know, funny book or, you know, finding a joke book, anything that you can do to laugh every day is going to help again to restore your brain and to cause your brain to regenerate. Um, there's many proverbs and in, in, in the Bible and, and throughout history that has talked about how laughter is medicine to our bones and to our body. So getting laughter in some way, somehow, I, you know, I, I don't want you to be on screens, but if you have to go on YouTube and watch somebody doing something stupid to laugh, then go and do that, you know, any which way that you can laugh every day. Getting enough sunshine, you know, it's, you know, we live at this latitude um, in this area of the, the Midwest where we don't get a lot of direct sun exposure. So when you do go outside, if you don't have any photo photosensitivity, I would re really recommend that you go outside and do don't put your sunglasses on for at least 20 minutes. And even taking your eyeglasses off is helpful so you can get that direct sunlight into the eyes. That also is helpful and restorative for the brain. At the eyelids training, they had some talks about looking at the brain and looking at, you know, Lyme encephaloph encephalopathy that is the inflammation of the brain. And they talked about doing, you know, a neuroquant scan or a spec scan, the PET scans. All of those things, um, my concern about getting those scans is like if you, if you have difficulty with word finding, you have memory issues, do I need a scan? that has radiation to tell me that your brain is inflamed. I, I don't believe so, and I don't, I'm not a big proponent of advocating, you know, it radi additional radiation exposure. Sometimes those are needed in order for us to be able to get coverage for the patient or for disability. You know, there's other circumstances that would negate that, yeah, if that's what we need to do, then let's do that, and then we can detox the body. Um, but I really like EEG neurofeedback because you can put these electrodes up on the brain and you get the functionality of the brain and what's going on in the brain, but then you can also do a treatment as well. So I think that is something that's promising and helpful as well. Um, so in conclusion, I just wanna recap and then would be open to um, any questions that you have, is that just our brains need to be protected you know, and, and, and sometimes they possibly need to be retrained. So Annie Hopper's, you know, dynamic neural retraining program um, is, is so helpful and has been very helpful with a lot of my patients. And, you know, for patients who can't attend their seminar, she's got a DVD program. It's a couple hundred dollars. You can do that viewing from your own home. Um, and working through this um, is, is such a, a great adjunct. If you have not heard of it, I would encourage you to look on YouTube and do some research on her website about it. It. Um, removing inflammation. So obviously we talked about diet and different um, ways that you can tweak your diet so that maybe you will um, be able to get better relief of your symptoms, whether that's cutting out nightshades or high glutamate foods. Um, 
and also staying away from foods that have a lot of hormones. Um, I really love a paleo diet, but I really advocate for more um, of a plant-based paleo diet. So you're, you know, you're doing some proteins, but majority of it should be coming from plants. And, um, and if you do have meats, then making sure that they're hormone free, making sure they're sustainably raised and that they're grass fed and they're not fed a bunch of GMO you know, um, grains that are, are laden with glyphosate and pesticides that are causing inflammation in the body. Remember our lymphatic positioning of the brain at night before you go to bed, elevating the head of the bed a little bit, doing some of the lymphatic drainage, you know, for um, the cisterna chile, um, you know, just getting, going, jumping on a mini trampoline for, you know, I recommend 20 minutes twice a day, but at first just starting with five minutes twice a day and working up to that. So they have these little rebounders that you can jump on, you know, that will really help to get that lymphatic flowing as well. Staying away from alcohol. Alcohol is a known toxin. You know, it will elevate you know, blood sugar levels. It's difficult for the liver to, to synthesize and, and toxins to get out of the body. And as well, taking our binders before we go to bed and even throughout the day. If you're having Herx reactions, get some binders on board so that you can help to absorb some of those toxins and those cytokine storms that are being released into the body. And then fasting. Um, a lot of times, you know, patients will have issues where, you know, um, somebody will remodel their basement and they'll have a lot of new construction, you know, so vinyl and vinyl releases VOCs, the vital organic compounds, that can cause um, reactions in the body as well and increase toxin exposures. Um, electric magnetic radiation from the phones and from any Wi-Fi devices, um, and also mold. I oftentimes see a lot of mold symptoms very similar to Lyme symptoms, and so sometimes you need to treat both of those, um, making sure that the place that you're residing in, whether it's your workspace or your home space, has been checked for mold if you're suspicious of it. If you can smell mildew, you can smell that musty smell, there's probably mold, and that's dampening your immune system's ability to be able to fight off these infections. Um, brain retraining, we talked about that and how laughter and sunshine um, is so important. And at the bottom, there's um, some resources of different books that, that are fabulous. The Conquering Lyme Brain, um, Fallon and, and, and um, Sotsky had put together some of the most up-to-date research on Lyme Brain. And um, Annie Hopper's books listed on there. There's the brain that changes itself. Um, and then there was this uh, neuroscientist that developed and put together um, this book, Newberg and, and Waldman, How God Changes Your Brain. And so those are some resources that I think would be really helpful, really good reads um, that, that I think would be very beneficial.